Yay. All right, we even remembered to record. We're good. <laughs> so um, um, we got a ton to cover. Um, hopefully we can get it all done in a couple hours. Um, I want to let you all know that the handout is up on the website. So we, we do have a, a handout. I even double spaced it because you guys had asked us to do that. And I thought that was a great idea. Wow, are you listening? I am listening. That's right. So if you wanted to print it out and make some notes on it, um, that's, uh, again, it is on the website on the um, uh, under the events tab and today's date. And you can print that out. And um, again, if you're going to watch it later at a later time or whatever, you'll have plenty of time to do that. Um, again, I want to reemphasize, this is a very, we've designed this as a very basic class for people who um, are just purchasing a machine and want to know how to do the basics, how to wind the bobbins, uh, thread it. Um, we're going to cover the different feet. Um, we are going to um, cover your settings page because it's a pretty powerful tool for you. Um, it, it is designed around the baby lock and brother machines. So if you um, if you have a Viking or a Foss, we're probably not going to be getting into a lot of your specifics because we are going to focus, of course, on the on the baby lock and brother machine. So, um, saying all that, um, Kate, do you have anything you want to add there? Um, no, just um, if you do have any questions. We are going to oh, be yeah, muting you. everybody. So thank if you, you do have any questions, um, please type it in your chat box um, in the bottom right corner. And when um, Patrick's I... showing you something, I'm going to be watching the comments and vice versa when we switch off. And just to, again, for those of you who are new to Zoom, I know this is a, um, a beginning class, so some of you haven't taken a Zoom before. Um, on the, I'm gonna see if I can get a picture of the computer over here. Uh oh, <laughs> what happened? Okay, we're back. I'll hold it once okay. you show. Okay, so if you scroll your mouse um, down on the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see a little box that comes up. It's gonna have the word chat on it. It's also going to, um, if you wanted to turn your camera on, you can you can turn your camera on there, but. Again, if you click on that chat box, it'll open up on the right-hand side of your screen here. And you can, again, communicate with us that way. You're gonna see a little to everyone thing. That ensures, because there's several Patrick Arnolds on here, and it's gonna ensure that Kate and I will both be able to get the message. Um, so if you do it to everyone, and that way everyone can um, see your question and when we answer it and everything else. So. Um, so this is designed as a, um, a class for people that are new on the machines, or as um, Terry just said, is a good refresher course. Hopefully, um, I know that we've got some pretty experienced people that have joined us this morning. Um, so hopefully you will get something out of the class. <laughs> Let's hope do. you learn one thing. <laughs> That's all that matters, right? <laughs> All right, and with that, I think we're gonna mute you all right. and we're gonna go ahead and get started here. So anybody have any questions before we mute? We're good? All right. Did you get it? Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear us? Can you give us a thumbs up out there? Are we good? All right, that's good. Okay, so. So we do, first of all, we do have two different machines here this morning. So we do have a Solaris, but we also have a Baby Lock Unity. So we may be switching from one machine to the other to be able to show you some of the things, okay? Just so that you're aware if we start switching machines on you. Um, first thing we'll, we're going to do is show you, again, just the basics on um, threading the machine and then winding the bobbin. And again, um, I have a special trick that I've been teaching for years, years and years now. And this is just one of those things. It's not going to be in your, your uh, manual, um, but on winding a bobbin, um, 
the baby lock bobbin winder is super awesome. Do we have a bobbin? <laughs> Good job, I've got you prepared. That's right, exactly. So I'm gonna probably have you hold the, the camera. Here. Okay. So first of all, on baby lock owners um, who have electronic machines, 90% of the electronic machines now have a separate bobbin winding motor. So you actually have a separate motor that actually drives your bobbin winder. And that's different from the one that drives your needle. So let me, you wanna let her in. Mm -hmm. So saying that, um, you could actually wind a bobbin as you're sewing or as you're embroidering or whatever the case may be. So it, again, you don't have to stop sewing in order to wind the bobbin. Um, so I'm gonna take you through step-by-step step here on exactly how to do that. We of course have two spool pins here. You can use either one of these to wind your bobbin. It doesn't matter which, okay? Um, um, you also have, of course, the bobbin. I'm gonna talk a little bit about bobbins. They're class 15 bobbins that we use for the baby lock and brother machines. Um, it's really, really important that you use pretty high quality bobbins um, especially if you're going to plan on winding thread over and over and over again. I would never ever wind a bobbin on a, a pre-wound. When you get done with the pre-wound, I would throw that bobbin away. The plastic that it's made with is really cheap and you'll tend to warp your bobbin if you try to rewind thread on it. So just keep that in mind. You can see the bobbins that we sell for the Baby Lock and Brother machines have like a blue tint to them. They're made out of a really, really, um, uh, uh, high quality plastic, and they're not going to warp on you as easy um, on your machine um, or when you rewind over and over again. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to just pop that bobbin down onto my bobbin winder here. Okay. And here's where the, the part that you're not going to learn in your books comes in. Um, your bobbin winder spring is on the top of the machine. And again, it looks sort of like this for, um, uh, for the Solaris and some of the higher end machines. Some of you might have just a single spring, but again, they're, they're the same concept. I'm actually gonna have you guys wrap twice around your bobbin winder spring. So you'll wrap it once and then you'll bring it around twice. And what that does is that ensures that you're gonna stay under that spring through the entire bobbin winding experience, okay? So, um, and it winds a perfectly straight bobbin. Again, the book just tells you to go around once. I'm gonna have you do a double wrap around that. And then we're gonna come over to the bobbin. You're just gonna wrap about seven, five or six or seven times around. And then I don't know if you can see this, but on the bottom, you've got a little groove cut on your bobbin, uh, or excuse me, on your bobbin winder. You can put your thread back through there and just pull and there's a little knife blade, easier said than done, I missed it. And it's gonna actually cut that thread off for you. So if you just pull it back across that knife blade, it'll, it'll actually cut that thread off for you. You're then gonna pop the bobbin winder over and then a little screen's gonna pop up on your screen that asks you if you really wanna start the bobbin winding experience and how fast you wanna go. You can adjust the speed on that. You can touch the start button and it's gonna magically take off. And again, you can see because we wiped, wrapped around twice on here, it's gonna keep this really nice and tight and really nice and even on your bobbin winder. And it will stop on its own when it gets full. This little pin is gonna, gonna move over and you're gonna be able to, um, have a nice full bobbin. Uh, it is set at the factory. On the Solaris, it's kind of cool because you do have the three settings over here where we can rent, wind a really full bobbin. You actually have five settings. Five settings, oh yeah, you do. So we have five settings on there. We can wind a really full bobbin and then do variants um, to a really not full bobbin. Is that, um, is that a word? I don't think it's a very good terminology, but okay. <laughs> So, so again, we got really full to not full. So that's, uh, that's just how we wind our bobbin. 
somebody just asked about um, sidewinders. Um, so sidewinders, um, honestly, compared to the quality of the bobbin winding you're gonna get on your baby lock machine, I would strongly recommend that you use your built-in bobbin winder. Um, as an absolute emergency, yes, the sidewinders are okay. They are not very good quality. And I um, really don't have a good source for you for a better quality um, sidewinder. Okay, so once our bobbin is wound, again, we're gonna pop our bobbin into the bobbin case. We are going to spin it counterclockwise inside of there. You're gonna come back through the slot opening in behind and cut your thread off. That's all you have to do with the Baby Lock and Brother machine on the drop-in systems. Um, you do not have to pull your bobbin thread up. You're ready to sew at this point. Okay. Okay, you wanna do threading? Sure. Okay. So now we are gonna go ahead and we are going to um, thread our machine. Um, you wanna let them in. So to thread your machine, you are going to put your spool of thread onto the machine. We're gonna talk about spool caps in just one moment. And then we are gonna go from here, we are going to take it under this first silver bar right here. This is number one. We're gonna bring it all the way back. There's a slit at the back of the machine and you just follow the path. You're gonna bring it all the way down. And then it has an arrow for you to follow. This is number three. Number four, you're gonna bring it all the way up and it just falls right into that take up arm. If you just kind of take like a wide turn with that thread as it comes down. And then, and this is probably the hardest um, guide for people to get into. It's number six and it's open from the right side. So there is a little slit right here. And a lot of people try to take this um, floppy piece of thread and they're trying to get this in multiple different ways and it's not behaving itself. So what I like to do is I like to take my thread horizontally. I like to put some tension on this little piece of thread. It's about an inch and a half of thread here. Put some tension on it, take it up to the slit and slide it in. And then we are going to take it through this slit. Can you zoom in there a little bit so they can see that, Patrick? There's a tiny little slit. And then up into this guide, that's number seven. And then we have a thread cutter up on the side of the machine. And then we have a, where were you going? I don't then know. Then <laughs> we have our needle threader. <clears throat> so we're gonna go ahead and just press our needle threader and it will thread the needle for us. So just a couple of comments on needle threaders, because again, we have a lot of people who um, uh, love needle threaders. I would not even attempt to show a machine anymore without a needle threader, but needle threaders do get bent. And I wanna go over exactly the reason that they do get bent. Um, two things, first of all, you've got a really small little pin on that needle threader as it's coming down and it comes through your, the eye of your needle. If you happen to have a um, needle that's bent a little bit or that you've used a little bit too long or even one that has too small of an eye for the thread that you're trying to use, what's gonna happen is when the needle threader comes through the eye of the needle and then pulls that heavier thread back through the needle, it's gonna catch because it can't make its way back out of the eye of the needle, okay? And that's what usually causes our needle threader problems where then all of a sudden it won't um, thread that needle any longer. Okay, so the needle threader tends to work better on size 70 and above. Um, again, the, the size 70 needle has a little bit, um, a little bit smaller opening to it than for instance a 75 or an 80. Okay, so um, if you try to thread a 60 or a 65 needle, there is an opportunity to damage that needle threader. Um, so just be careful on that is my suggestion to you. Um, also, again, make sure that your needle is not bent at all. 
And also you wanna make sure that your needle is in the upright position, the most upright position. The machines, the newer machines will tell you that, the older machines will not. So I always have a good uh, rule of thumb before I thread a needle, I push my needle up down key twice to make sure that that needle is in, indeed in the top position before I thread my needle. That way you won't have a broken needle threader right off the bat. Okay. Can we talk about these real quick? Oh, sure. So, um, spool caps, I, and I don't know what Patrick would tell you about this, but I am not a big lover of spool caps. Um, I have found that the thread can sometimes, if I was to put my spool of thread on and I have a cap like this, um, what can happen is that the thread gets caught around the pin in between there and it catches and um, so my preference of spool caps is to 100% of the time use this little guy right here. This is the mini spool cap. And this one will actually seat itself right inside the end of the spool. Um, so it doesn't and it cannot interfere with the, with the thread coming off the spool. This is literally holding the spool onto the spool pin so that the spool itself can't move, but it will not interfere with the movement of the thread coming off the spool itself. So this is my go-to cap. So, and just to add a little bit to that, my recommendation on spool caps, um, the only time I really, really recommend a spool cap is if you have like a Coates and Clark thread that has those groove edges on the outside of the spool itself. If you have that older style of spool, Again, if you don't use a spool cap, that thread can catch on those groove edges and it can cause you all kinds of problems. Can I borrow the, the spool cap? Um, I want the large one in this instance. So my recommendation on spool caps, when you have a regular spool or you have those notches around is use the size of spool cap that completely covers the spool of thread um, the best. Okay, so in other words, if you had a big spool like we have here, you're gonna use your largest size. If you've got a smaller spool like Kate has over on the Unity there, you wanna show them that one? Sure. You're gonna use the medium size spool cap on that one because again, it just barely covers, it covers the entirety of it, but it just barely does. So again, it does it the best, um, the best possible way there. Okay, so that's uh, that's my little spiel. So on spool with the caps. newer machines, yes, I believe you should get that mini spool cap um, with the new ones. It if does. You've, that's if correct. you've got an older um, model, they get, maybe a few years old, maybe three to five years old, then you probably did not get that. They get um, lost very easy, by the way. So when we do carry them in bulk, so if you do need a, one of those great caps. They are by far the best for the embroidery threads, especially. Uh -huh. um, fixing the needle threader, um, good luck, Kat. It's really, really difficult. Again, we do carry those in bulk um, just because so many of them do get bent. It is a very difficult thing um, to actually try to rebend that pin. Um, if your needle threader is broke, my first suggestion is to put in a new needle. And is there a top side to the spool cap? Um, good question. Um, no, there's no top side. Uh, it, well, there is, there's a inside and an outside. It's sort of concaved and you, you can't really miss it, but um, it, it has a sort of a bend. And then the other side, the, the other side is, a, is smooth. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. And the smooth side is the outside. All right, are we ready? Mm -hmm. So that was a 30 minute lecture on how to thread your machine. And that was just the first line. We better move a little <laughs> yes, bit faster. Better. All right, you ready? Yes, so. Um, I'm gonna let you do the feet most okay. of the feet because you're better at it. So what we're going to start talking about now is not all of them, but the standard feet that come with your machine. Mm -hmm. Maybe. 
Okay, so the first foot that comes with your machine is your standard straight stitch zigzag. And all of your machines do tell you which foot to use for what stitch. Um, and I don't know how, yeah, you can see that I think. So you'll see that it has a J on it. So your J is your standard sewing foot. So when you bring up your um, straight stitch or your zigzag on your machine, it will tell you up across the top that you should be using your J foot. Your J foot has this special little leveling um, screw on the side. A lot of people, are, you know, they wonder what that's actually used for. I'm going to give you a quick demonstration on what this is used for, because a lot of people don't realize um, don't realize um, exactly how to use that. The Unity, by the way, is not an embroidery only machine. The Unity is a sewing and an embroidery machine, both. So it, um, it was close to the top of the line back in the day. Okay, so I've just got a couple of pieces of some heavy canvas here. And um, what we are going to do is we are going to sew over this heavy canvas. So what we have is we go from two layers up to eight layers of heavy canvas here. And what can happen is that as this is going through, your foot is going to start to sit at an angle as it's trying to get up and over that heavy fabric. So what you can do with this leveling foot is you can, first of all, select a straight stitch. Um, so you can start to sew. And as that foot becomes at the point where it is sitting at an angle, what you are going to do is you are going to press in on the little black button and it will lock itself in place. So I don't know if you can see that from there, but it has actually created, Oops. whoops. Whoa, Oops. you're taking them for a nice <laughs> ride there. So it has locked itself in. It has locked itself in place. And then we can continue on. And you will actually see it clip. Did you see it jump back out? I don't know if you saw that, but it reset itself once it had reached that new height. So what that does is it actually creates a leveling point for the foot to go over the new height of fabric on there. Um, the next foot that we are going to good um, work, Kate. That was really you like that? impressive. I think so. Um, the next foot we're going to look at is the N foot. Now, the N foot, when we sit it right next to the J foot, the first thing that you will notice is that it is wider. And the reason that it is wider is because it's actually our go to foot for just about all of our decorative stitches. So it has a wider area, but the big difference is not really there. The big difference is actually on the bottom of the foot. So the J foot is completely flat on the back, but the N foot has a groove cutout. I'm trying to angle that so you can see it. I think you can see it there. It has a groove cutout in here. What that allows us to do is for the thread to build up underneath the foot when we're doing decorative stitches and the foot will still sit nice and flush over those decorative stitches. So your end foot is definitely the foot, it's called a monogramming foot because you would probably use it if you were doing um, the small monogramming letters, but it's also primarily used for all of your decorative stitches. So it looks like they learned their one thing, we can stop now. They didn't know what the pin was on the J foot. Are we done? <laughs> Okay, the next foot that we're going to look at is the M foot. And I love how this one is in red, so we can actually read the letter without getting glasses on. So the M foot is our button sewing foot. And this one is designed. One? This one is designed so that the foot will actually hold our button in place whilst we are stitching it down. So we want to, um, if you imagine this is on the machine, I'm doing it off the machine because I think you can see it all better than when it's actually attached to the machine. 
Um, so if you imagine the machine is going to do a zigzag, but it's not going to move forward. So it's going to do a zigzag in place. What happens is that this button will actually seat itself in between a lip on the foot right here. And we align it up so that it is the holes are parallel with the little red markings on the foot. Can you let somebody in? Uh -huh. And your button sewing stitch on your machine, I'm not gonna sew it, but I am gonna show you the stitch so you know where to get it. It is going to be in your buttonhole segment. So whether any of the baby lock machines, you will go to where your buttonholes are. And in this machine, it's on page two. So it's the one that looks like just a little, it's kind of blurred, I think, isn't it? Actually, it's not. No, it's, good. it's just blurred to me because yeah, I've got right. bad eyesight. <laughs> um, and when you select that, you'll notice that the machine does tell you what foot to use. It looks like it's just a dash because it's just going to do a zigzag in place. So the stitch length is going to be set to zero because it's not going to travel forward. Um, and then the machine, and we are going to be talking about these features here in just a few minutes, but the machine automatically has selected the tie off button. So this little button right here is your tie off. If you want it to automatically cut after it's finished sewing on the button, you would press the little scissor button there too. But we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a few minutes. Okay, so the next one is um, foot R. And this is a blind hem foot. So it looks like this from the front. And it has a silver bar right down the middle there. Trying to show you all angles here. I'm going to show them blind hem. Um, does everybody know how to do a blind hem on their machine or would they like me to show them? Remember, this is for beginners. It's for We're beginners. Okay, it. let's do it. <laughs> We're gonna do it. You need to figure out the camera a little bit better. Yeah. So I've attaching the foot and we're gonna go back to utility stitches. And we're going to select a blind hem stitch. So we're just going to select on this machine, it's 1-15, but it kind of looks like a, a zigzag that has a straight Can stitch you guys in see between. That? Hold on, I'm gonna get around the other end here. Sorry. See that better now. So a blind hem is all about the folding of the fabric. So the blind hem, you are going to, on a cotton fabric, you would want to press up your raw edge. So probably like a quarter of an inch, I'm just finger pressing. You would want to take the time and press this with an iron. Then you are going to fold up your hem. And I think it's the same number on the Solaris. Um, they, they've kept the Stitch number's pretty. No, it's not. Oh, it isn't. No. Okay. It's number 16. 1 16. Yes. Okay. 1 16 on the Solaris. Okay. So, the all we've done here is folded up a double hem. So, the biggest thing when you are doing an invisible hem or a blind hem on your sewing machine is that you want to make sure that your thread matches 100% to your fabric, both bobbin and top thread. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this back so that I have a little lip of the fold. Here's the, my folded edge that's been put in there. And I have my bulk of my garment to the left. Okay. Okay. Going back around. Uh-oh. Okay, so what we're doing is we're putting the fold of the fabric up against the bar in the foot. We're gonna lower our presser foot down. 
and I'm going to so slowly. I know you don't believe me, but I am. And what we, what we are going to do, yeah, I think they can see that. So here is my folded edge. Here's my hem. And I've just folded this back. And what the machine is going to do is it's going to take a forward stitch and then it's going to take a zigzag. And I'm going to adjust this just a little bit here. Would you adjust it too? You move that down a little bit. So the idea is that the zigzag swing is taking just a very small bite into the fold of that fabric. And then what happens when I fold this up, I get a lot of little bites, okay? Now, if this was the red thread, then we wouldn't be seeing these, okay? Yeah. Hence the blind hem. So the ideal stitch point would be something like this, okay, where it is tiny. You can adjust the distance between the bites by the stitch length. You can adjust the depth of the bite by the stitch width. So that is something that you need to play with. They wanna see the backside. Oh. So that's the backside and that's the way that stitch is gonna look. It's number 16 on the Solaris. And 15 on pretty much all the other machines, I think. They, they keep a, the stitch, I, I already did. Uh, they keep the stitch length um, or the stitch numbers pretty consistent on the machines. Um, and so that's gonna be your blind hem foot. Okay, so the next foot we're gonna talk about is your G foot. And your G foot is your overlock foot. Now your overlock foot, in my opinion, would be the one that would be probably the least used on the sewing machine, because hopefully you all have a serger that will give you that much more professional finish um, than an overlock stitch on your sewing machine. So the overlock foot has a pin. Can you see that little pin right there? Kind of acts like a, um, the pin that the stitch is formed over. Um, very similar to what it does on the serger. And then, whoops, then it has this nice long edge right here that you would put the edge of your fabric against. So this one, your fabric would ride right up against the edge right here, and it would just stitch right over. Um, you do have overlock stitches on your machine. So any stitch that looks like a straight stitch and a zigzag together is going to be considered an overhead stitch. So like 1-17, for instance. And then you will notice that it does tell me to put my G foot on. So if you need to, because I know sometimes um, that setting up your serger for just a quick um, overlock can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge and you just want to do something really quickly. Um, so this is the one time that I maybe would use that foot and just quickly do a quick overlock on the sewing machine. But obviously your serger is going to cut your fabric, create the seam and overlock all in one operation. It's going to give you a much better finish. Okay, um, buttonhole foot. I love the buttonhole foot. So we're going to show you the buttonholes on both machines because the Solaris does have something that's a little bit different. Um, but I know a lot of you that have Arias or Crescendos or any of the regular baby lock machines have a foot that looks just like this. So I'm going to show you how quick and easy this is. Got to find my button from earlier. So this is your buttonhole foot. And all you do is use this slider and you slide it out and put your button right in here. So you put your button in and slide it in so it's nice and snug. The machine will now know what size buttonhole to do based on the button that you have on the foot. Hold on really quick. Barb, on that, um, the overlock foot would be as close as you can get to a serger without owning a serger on a sewing machine. That makes sense because the type of stitch that you're going to use has a straight stitch and a zigzag with it. 
and it'll sort of allow you to uh, prevent some of that fraying. So yes, it, it, it is sort of like the, um, it is sort of like the, um, as close as you can get to a, to a sewing machine or to a serger. So the foot is actually going to attach on, it is your A foot, correct? So um, the foot is going to attach on right on this bar and the button goes to the back of the machine. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna place this on. We're gonna show you, by the way, both the way you do this on 90% of the machines and also how you do it on the Luminaire and the Solaris. So there's a, a different system on the Luminaire and the Solaris. So on the um, older baby lock machines, you have a lever somewhere that, can you see this lever right here? No. Nope. They will when you pull it down. So you're gonna pull this down. And, and it's, it's gonna go behind that. It's gonna seat itself right in here. Can you see where it has positioned itself? This is what's going to tell it what size to do. So I am going to, this is how easy buttonholes are. I'm actually gonna hold the camera and sew the buttonhole and talk to you all at the same time. <laughs> so I'm just going to lower my presser foot down and I'm actually unplugging my foot control and I'm just using my start stop button. But of course I have to select a buttonhole first. And now I have a green button. And all I'm gonna do is press my green button. Did you put your scissors on? No. <laughs> so okay no laughing <laughs> yeah i do what's happened there okay i'm gonna let you show it on that machine because my right. my machine didn't stitch I don't know what <laughs> <laughs> all right so let me show you on the solaris on how to do our buttonholes on the solaris we have a foot it's called the a plus foot on the solaris Biggest difference is the Solaris or the Luminaire is actually going to use our um, projector in order to measure the size of the buttonhole on the Solaris. The advantages that gives it to us on Kate's foot, you're regulated to uh, a really small button, not a really small. I mean, it'll do a pretty good size button, but the Solaris and the Luminaire will do a ginormous button. We can fit a huge button in this foot. And because the projector is what's going to um, do the measuring for us, it'll allow us to sew a great big giant area here if we want to, okay? So that's the really cool thing. It also comes with this little slide plate here. I don't know if you can see that, but it sticks, the foot actually goes over a ridge here that will allow us to keep our um, distance from the edge of the material to the buttonhole consistent. So again, it, um, it's, this is not adjustable, but it, you can, um, with the edge of this foot here, you could move your fabric over to the side of that and keep it consistent all the way down your garment if you if you're, want to make sure that it's staying consistent. Okay, so I did just quickly sew that buttonhole out. There you go. Yay. And look how pretty that buttonhole is. I even have black thread in my bobbin and you cannot even see the diff, you cannot even see because the machine automatically changes your tension for you so that you get a really pretty smooth buttonhole stitch. Will you hand me a button, please? Oh, a button, sorry. Um, so my problem was the bobbin um, in the machine. So again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my button in the front of my foot and we're gonna snap that foot down onto that button. Okay, we're then gonna go into our buttonhole menu and we're gonna choose whatever buttonhole style you want. And again, you can see they've got a ton of buttonhole selection on our machine. 
Um, I'm going to just pick a standard buttonhole here. Um, I want to show you a couple of other things too on the Solaris um, that, that are really neat features. Right now, we have um, told the machine that we're going to have it measure the button. However, if we want to tell the machine that, okay, we want to program it, we can just touch that little button there and you can see the slit length on here will come up to whatever millimeter measurement you want to go. So if you have a 14 millimeter button, you can actually just program in 14 millimeters and you don't need to go through the process of this foot, if that makes sense. So, but again, that's what that particular button is for there. And we can just uh, program in our stitch length. But this is much more fun. So the other thing is, again, Kate was saying that automatically our tie off is going to be set for us, but we can also program our scissors an electronic scissors here, touching that button, and it is automatically going to tie off at the end and cut. So we're going to have a completed buttonhole when we finish sewing this. The other thing, again, I'm going to actually unplug my foot control also. I'm going to take that foot control out. And we're gonna go over, let me see if I can get the angle of this camera correct. I can hold it. Okay. So this um, buttonhole foot, you can sew either with this plate on or with it off. It doesn't matter. You can, um, again, either one will work. So I'm gonna sew it with it on here just so I can show you. Um, and we're gonna actually just snap that foot down, maybe. We're gonna snap the foot down in place. We're then, all you're gonna do on your garment is measure where you want that buttonhole to end. Okay, and then again, you can use the edge of this foot here as an edge guide to, um, uh, for the placement of your buttonhole. It's always gonna sew backwards first. So I'm gonna lower my presser foot down. I get my green light. And all I'm gonna do is hit the start button. It's that hard. Again, the machine is actually, the projector is what's measuring the buttonhole on this. So you'll see as it gets further away from that projector, it speeds up, then it slows down. It's gonna do its tie off. It's so cool. And when it finishes, it's gonna do the tie off again. It's gonna automatically cut our threads and our buttonhole is completely done. And again, it's set to the right, uh, the right size for that particular button. Again, just an incredible buttonhole system on both machines. Um, the Solaris works a tiny bit different than the, the Unity and the rest of the machines. And then the last foot that we are going to cover during this basic class is going to be your zipper foot. So your zipper foot, and it's not my favorite zipper foot, I will tell you that. There's lots of different zipper feet that Baby Lock have available, but this is the one that comes as a standard zipper foot. And this, what is nice about it is that you can actually, um, you can actually attach this either to the left side or to the right side. So don't try and straddle it in the middle. That's not what it's designed for. It will either attach to the left or to the right. And then of course, you've got your needle position, which we are gonna be talking about your needle position. And then you can adjust your needle position left to right, depending where you want the edge to come. Um, there are other um, machine, um, zipper feet available and those <clears throat> those we will be talking about in our baby lock club so those we wanted to keep this one purely to the standard feet that come with the machine um, so this is your standard zipper foot but know that there are about three or four extra different zipper feet that are available if you don't fall in love with this one um, we, um, the walking foot, we're really not going to be covering today. Um, Susan, we are planning, what machine does Susan have? Do you know? Susan, can you tell us what machine you have, please? 
Um, so there is, there's a standard mechanical walking foot and there's also a digital dual foot. So because we know that we've got all types of people in here with different um, levels of machines, we've chosen only to go over the feet that would be applicable to all machines. But there is something, if you are participating in our baby lock club, that is something that we would be doing there. So oh, the Presto, Presto. Okay. so this is perfect class for you to learn a lot of those, um, learn a lot of those um, different feet. So the Presto would have what they call a mechanical walking foot. Um, I, I don't think I have a mechanical walking foot here to show. Um, so if you give me a call at the store this afternoon, Susan, I can try and um, talk you through that a little bit, but it's very easy. Um, okay, so moving on, um, we are going to be um, talking about the digital door feed with all of the extra feet that are available for some of the machines. And that is something that we will be covering in Baby Lock Club. Yes, so again, we will get into a lot of the different accessory feet in the club but um, again we're we are keeping this basically to the feet that come with all machines so um saying that you want to move on to the settings page sure okay 90 percent of electronic machines have a settings page to them okay um and i i'm trying to think if the presto has the settings page um the lyric on up i know does so we've, we've got settings on from the the lyric machine all the way up in the electronic line you have a way of setting your machine up to your individual specifications on a lot of different um, settings and applications so when you're looking for the settings page and i'm going to go through we're going to go through the solaris here which has every setting imaginable uh, so you're going to get a variant of this on uh, for those of you with electronic machines you're going to get some kind of variant on this particular screen so the screen that we're talking about um, or anytime i tell you to go into your settings page in um, in a class or anything it's the little sheet of paper it's the same symbol on all the machines okay so if you see this sheet of paper that's where you're going to actually set your machine up to your liking or to what you want to um how you want to have it set up. Um, the first um, set of um, set of pages are going to be for sewing mode. So on on all of them. Again, if you have an embroidery and a sewing machine, you're going to have not only sewing mode, you're also going to have machine settings, and you're going to have embroidery settings. So again, the settings page is a very powerful tool. It's awesome. We're going to go through it step by step here, so you know what all of the different um, all of the different buttons mean. Um, all of the machines have what they call width control on our um, slide bar. Let me see if I can get a picture of both of those. So the slide bar on this machine um, will control the speed that we sew with, unless we go into our settings page and turn our width control knob on. When we do that, it now takes this button away. It is no longer speed control, but what it's gonna control is our needle position. I'm gonna go to a straight stitch here, maybe. Um, someone asked what the, is the two icons next to the Wi-Fi? Um, they're talking about up here. I don't know because the Wi-Fi, the camera is next to that one and then the settings. Okay, so what I'm gonna do again, what I've done is I've turned that with control on. So now when we actually move this slide bar, I am physically controlling where my needle position is in the needle plate, okay? Now you have to be careful with this because I had a lady um, call me yesterday and said, I can't adjust my stitch width anymore. Um, and so, and this would literally was just a conversation I had yesterday. And so I'm trying to talk her through it. She had accidentally gone into her settings menu. She had turned this function on. And when you do that, you lose control over your stitch width and it just blinks at you. And then the way you can tell that you're in the, in the width control is you have the little symbol on the screen here 
So again, when we move this, we're moving our needle position rather than controlling our speed. Okay, so back to settings. Um, these two are gonna uh, actually be a fine tuning adjustment for your decorative stitches. It is something that we do, we need to admit a couple of people there. Um, it is something that we do when we service your machine. So again, the fine adjustment of vertical and horizontal stitches is for decorative settings. Um, uh, I'm not gonna cover those too much in the class because they're too confusing. If you wanna know more about them, you can come in and talk to me or call me and I can talk you through it over the phone. Um, presser foot height, just that. So again, our normal presser foot height is 7.5 millimeters above the needle plate when we're in the up position on our presser foot. If you have really, really thick fabric and you wanna raise that to 10 millimeters, you can, and now every time we stop our foot, it's gonna come up 10 millimeters above the needle plate. Um, uh, or again, if you don't like it that tall, you can adjust it down a little bit also. So um, presser foot pressure, this is an important one. The presser foot pressure is how much pressure there is on the um, fabric as you're sewing. So you'll notice that below that is an automatic fabric sensor system. Kate was explaining on the J foot when she had that, how it was actually um, all of the pressure of the foot was on the back side of the foot when she was trying to go over that, that seam. Can I can you hand me that real quick? So all of the pressure of the foot was on the back side of the foot as it was trying to go over the seam, and then the front side of the foot as it was coming down the other side. By turning our automatic fabric sensor system on, it automatically adjusts that for you. This is defaulted to off. So it's really important when you get your baby lock machine, if you have the fabric sensor system, don't ask me why they default it to off. You have to go into your settings page and turn that feature on. It's a really, really cool feature to have. So, um, so that's what fabric sensor system is. You wanna do page two? I don't know what's on page two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first one here is your initial position. Um, a lot of baby locks used to be defaulted to left needle position. So if you can see that oval um, circle right there, you're gonna notice that the needle is offset to the left side, or we have ours set with the needle in the center. That means that when we turn the machine on, the machine will automatically default to center needle position. Um, so that is something that you can control at startup. Um, the next one is um, our pivot height. So if your machine has the capability that it has the auto pivot function, the pivot function is where the needle stops down in the fabric, but the presser foot raises up so you can hands-free turn your fabric for applique. That's gonna be the main purpose for that. But if you are working with a heavier fabric, maybe a felt to applique or um, snuggle fabric or something of that nature, and you need that pivot height to be a little bit higher, then you can adjust the pivot height. So the Soprano all the way up have the sensor system on it and also the pivoting function on it. So it's the Soprano machine on up that you're going to have those particular applications to. And the next one is our free motion height adjustment. So this would be for um, if you were doing free motion, but maybe you were doing it on a high loft batting and you needed more space between the bottom of the foot and the fabric, you can adjust the height of the free motion. You have to be careful on free motion foot height because if you get the presser foot too far away from the fabric that you're sewing on, it bounces. It bounces and you're gonna have a lot more tendency to break threads. So you have to be careful on that. Why do we have this to 10? We must've been sewing on something. Do you want me to talk about this? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the dual feed adjustment, again, this is for the digital dual feed. The cool thing about this foot is you have control over um, how fast that conveyor belt. Do you have one of those feet? Yes, I can okay. get one. So you have control over how fast the conveyor belt actually moves. The bigger the number on this, and you can see it goes from zero to positive 10, 
and zero to negative 10. So the bigger the number, the faster that belt. And the belt that I'm talking about is this little conveyor belt right here. It is a walking foot on steroids. It's an awesome, awesome foot. I highly, highly recommend it. For those of you who have this technology, you really need to be using it if you have it. And, and again, you can go in, if we're on a silk and you're noticing that this foot is puckering that silk, we can go in there and we can turn that speed down on our conveyor belt to a negative number. It's gonna slow that conveyor belt down and you're gonna have a lot less tendency to pucker fabric on that, um, on that setting. So again, that's what that dual feed adjustment is. Several of your machines are also gonna have automatic presser foot lifter and press to trim. And what this means is the automatic presser foot lifter will allow us to start sewing. Um, uh, right now, if I have this turned off, the machine is gonna have a red light on it, no matter, uh, until I put the presser foot down. I'm gonna pick a stitch here. Okay, good, I've been there. So it'll have the red light when I lower the presser foot down. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's funny. So I, I turned my width control on, so it's not letting me go. So when I put my presser foot down, <laughs> I'm like, I can't figure out why it wasn't turning red or why it wasn't turning green. So it'll, it'll be red when my presser foot is up. So it won't let me stitch, okay? However, if I turn the um, page two, we're gonna turn the auto down and the auto press, even though my presser foot is up, it will now, when I touch my start stop button, it's gonna lower the presser foot and it's gonna start stitching um, no matter what. Same with trimming. You're actually gonna be able to just touch the trim button without lowering your presser foot and it'll automatically trim the fabric. Uh oh, and I messed that up. This is an easy page, Kate. Oh, I get this one? Yeah. Okay, so the next icon or the next page we have here is your initial stitch page. When you turn your machine on, are you wanting it to go to your standard utility stitches or would you like it to default straight to your quilting tab of stitches? So the, um, the, some of the computerized machines, the higher end machines have the capability where they have grouped a lot of your quilting stitches into one category. And this will allow us to have the machine automatically default to either of those two categories. So this is something that you can program yourself. Um, your next one is your reinforcement. So this one will do the automatic um, tie. We're gonna talk about that one here in just a few minutes. So this will automatically default it to a quilting tie off rather than a, a traditional, traditional reverse. tie off, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. And then the next one is a more advanced feature. Um, it is working with the end point um, stop and you would probably want this on, right? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. um, so we'll be covering that probably in a baby lock club, I would imagine. Um, the next one is pretty self-explanatory. What language would you like the machine to talk to you in? So you can change the language. All I will tell you is if you change the language, make sure you know how to get back to change it back to English. <laughs> um, your next one, I want as much light as possible. So I keep mine to five unless for sometimes when we are teaching classes, we will turn the light off because we get a glare. Um, so you can, um, it's not off or on, there's actually several different settings. So you can control that um, to whatever you want that to be. Um, the next one is the brightness of your LCD screen. So how bright your screen is. Um, the next one is your upper and bobbin thread sensors. It does on the Solaris give us an option. I don't believe this was on the Destiny. Yeah, I don't think so. It's yeah. only on the Solaris. It's only on the Solaris where you can turn off the sensor. It's so, more of a technician feature. Actually, I have an application for it. Oh, do you? So What's if, that? Well, if you're a scrapbooker and you want ah. to, um, if you want to stitch through cardstock, but not with thread. So you want it to create the holes for a decorative purpose. Then you can actually turn off 
your bobbin sensors. That's genius. Yeah. Wow. And the other time that I have actually done this too is if I have become unhooped halfway through an embroidery project and I'm trying to line it back up and I will actually want it to sew a little way without threading my needle so I can make sure that it's tracking directly on top of the design that's already there. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's so um, I have used my bobbin sensor for that. So I do believe that that is a Solaris only feature. Most of the time you're gonna want that on, okay? Um, the machine speaker volume, this is nice if you are sewing in the middle of the night and your husband is, uh, maybe you're sewing in your bedroom and every time you touch the screen, it gives you a little beep. You can turn that beep off so that you don't have any type of noise coming out of the machine. Um, and then the next one, and this is a feature that we will be covering in a baby lock club, I'm sure, but it actually adds in a third position on your needle up down function. So currently you have needle up or needle down. If you turn your needle position stitch placement to on, you will then have three different needle positions. So now when Patrick turns his needle down, it will actually just hover right above the fabric. It will not go all the way down. And then if he presses it one more time, it will go down and then all the way back up again. Okay, so this would be um, if you are trying to make sure that your needle drop is going to be positioned. Um, yesterday, I think you saw me do some, you may, may have seen me do some applique where I dropped my needle down so that I could make sure that it was gonna go down into my background fabric. So it was snug against my applique fabric. This would be a time that you might want to use this feature. A lot of machines have that too, by the way. So um, so the next page again, now we're into the machine um, setup here. So we can actually change our initial screen. Um, you can change the opening screen to a home page if you don't want it to go through that, um, uh, the floral, uh, set up you can turn it to a home page you can go to sewing and embroidery screen so again you can actually just personalize that on your initial screen eco mode will shut your machine down if you haven't used it in a specific amount of time so we can set it to 10 30 minutes uh, an hour and a half it'll actually turn your machine off for you in eco mode and the shut off support mode is the same thing so eco mode will just power it down it won't turn it completely off. The shut off support mode will turn it completely off. Screen saver will come on after five minutes. Again, you can change that. This is a cool feature on some of the higher end machines. You can actually personalize your screen saver. So if you wanna put um, your kids on your screen, um, your, your grandkids, whatever the case may be, it's got a default. You can touch customize and actually download pictures from a USB stick for your screensaver. And the majority of what we are going through in this settings page is going to be um, on a lot of the different baby lock machines. Um, your mouse pointer, you can just change, depending what color you have your background fabric or your background screen set to, you can change it either to a white mouse or a black mouse, um, or you can change that just a little bit. There is not a way to slow down the mouse. So the mouse is gonna move as quickly as you are moving it, um, but um, you can change the color of the mouse. Next page is Solaris only. So this, um, uh, you can actually change, again, powder outline is a really good thing to have on. If you guys have a Solaris or Luminaire, it's gonna show your pattern outline on your projector in real, um, um, real like stitches and instead of just lines on the screen you can do the projector brightness um, you can actually set that um, if it's not bright enough for you and it'll go through a brightness setting by touching that start button um, the background color is going to be the background of your um, is this an embroidery or is it in sewing or both um i think it's just an embroidery is it yeah it is okay page six right So we, again, that's going to be the background color um, on our um, in our embroidery screen. Um, you can change the pointer. This is going to be for your uh, laser function. You can change what uh, color it is and also the shape of it. 
And then again, you can also adjust your camera needle position. And this is something we will go through in club. Um, your next page, the top part of the page is gonna be your upgrade certifications, um, how many upgrades you have on your machine. And then um, the bottom part of the machine is a um, stitch counter. It's counting how many um, stitches the machine has taken. It since also- Since you've had it serviced. Since you've had it serviced. Um, and it's also telling you what board version you are on. And this number right here is like an internal serial number. You want to go through the embroidery or do you want to I think we should do the class? embroidery class. So we are going to skip over some of these embroidery settings because we will be covering that when we do the embroidery basics. Um, so these are all embroidery functions on page eight. Nine, 10, and 11, 10 12. and 11. Okay, so that is pretty much the settings that, that are going to be applicable to the sewing machine side of um, your machine. Okay, so we are going to move on. Anybody um, have any questions on any of that? Um, they asked which machines is the Baby Lock Club for? Um, basically, the Baby Lock Club is for any machine that has the camera technology um, you, you'll get something out of the Baby Lock Club if you have a machine that has camera technology in it. So we, we cover a lot on the IQ Designer. We always do a sewing technique, we do an embroidery technique, and then we do an IQ Designer project. So um, again, it's more of an advanced class where we do cover some of the, um, the feet, the accessory feet, the optional accessory feet. So it's, it's a uh, pretty fun. I, I enjoy teaching it. I hope you guys enjoy participating. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and we're going to move on to get to know some of our electronic keys that are on the screen. Um, and we're going to show you both on the, um, the older style machines and also on the Solaris because the Solaris um, some of these keys are kind of hid hidden and you have to press a key in order to be able to access them. Um, so we are going to um, we are going to go ahead and we're just going to select just a basic zigzag. So the first thing we're going to look at is how we can control the um, settings on this stitch. So when we call up a stitch, and it doesn't matter if we're pulling up a zigzag or a pretty decorative stitch, the machine has default. So the machine is preset to what the manufacturer thinks is a good setting for this stitch, but those we can override. So they are, they are just right across the bottom here um, on a Solaris. So the stitch width is set to 3.5. As I change the setting, you will see that the stitch actually on the screen changes. It also tells me up here that it's at 100%. This means that as the, the exact size that I see it on the screen is the size that it is going to sew out. And you can also see that when she made that adjustment, the little black box went away from what she when you're at default you got a black box around your stitch number when you adjust that it goes away so you know you've made an adjustment to that stitch so you can see how you can really manipulate these stitches to look way different than what they do when they first come in and most of the baby lock machines are going to show you a true likeness of what the stitch is going to look like after you have made the adjustments um, the other thing is on most of these machines, um, you probably have an automatic tension, but you have an override. And this is where you can adjust your tension. So a lesser number means lower tension and a higher number is a tighter tension. And what this is referring to is your top tension. So we're not adjusting the bobbin tension. We are adjusting the top thread tension. The Lyric on up have the automatic tension on the machine. So it's the Lyric machine 
all the way up to the Solaris that has that automatic tension feature. And if you have a mechanical um, or a machine that has a mechanical tension adjustment, it's going to be up here on the left hand side, it's going to be a dial that is right here that's going to have numbers. Higher the number, the tighter the tension, the lower the number, the looser the tension. Okay. Okay. Do you want to go through the other buttons? Yes. Okay. So here is the little icon that will allow us to get into some of the other electronic functions within a stitch. So we would press this and it's going to give us a drop down box with some features on it. The first box right here is going to be our free motion. Watch what happens to the stitch, the foot and the screen when I press this. You're going to notice, let's go into a straight stitch. You're going to notice that my O foot comes up. We did not discuss that today, but that is our open toe free motion foot. You may have heard like a little clicking noise when I selected that feature. And what that was doing was automatically dropping my feed dogs. So this is how you would set up your machine to do free motion quilting. By pressing this icon and the machine will drop the feed dogs and it will tell us what foot to use. And now when I attach the correct foot, and I try to start my quilting, it will actually tell me, um, it will actually lower the presser foot to the height that I have set in my settings page. And I will be able to free move the fabric and create my own um, stitching. Okay, so um, next one down is a pattern restart function. So, and again, a lot of machines have this particular function. Can I just address a quick question that sure. we had? Um, so the question was, is there a stitch length setting in free motion? And no, there is not, Bob, because that is up to you. That depends how slowly or quickly uh -oh. you are moving the fabric. Hold, please. Sorry about that. We um, are running out of batteries in the phone here, so we got to get it plugged in. Is it on? I hope so. <laughs> it looks on. like it, yeah. Yep. yep. Okay, so um, the stitch length is depending how quickly you move the fabric and how quickly um, you have your machine, what speed you have your machine set to. So um, that would be a, um, a different, um, so there's no, the machine is not gonna regulate that stitch length. Had all kinds of fun here. Okay. Okay, so again, pattern restart, we'll go back to the beginning of a pattern. This is more um, uh, important to you when you're doing decorative stitching. Because um, again, if we got into the middle of this pattern and we broke a thread and we wanted to pull out to the beginning of that, we could actually go into the this button to go back to the beginning of the stitch rather than uh, um, guessing where we need to actually set the machine up. And the next icon in there is our single pattern or repeat pattern. Can you pull up a decorative stitch there, Patrick, yeah. please? So we're going to pull up a decorative stitch. And so now you can see that the machine is either going to sew one complete pattern cycle and stop, or it will sew a repeat of the pattern. So either single or um, a repeat. The next icon, whoops, where's my delete? Um. Um, the next icon is actually going to be our mirror images. And the nice thing is it's irrelevant of which baby lock you have, these icons all look the same. So the next icon that we're gonna look at is our mirror images. So the first one we have is a side to side mirror image. So if you watch the screen where the design is and I press this, you're gonna notice that that design flips itself from left to right. 
And then the one underneath that is a lateral and that one will flip it basically from top to bottom. Do you want to show them how? Sure. Can... So what we can actually do on this one, if you have single pattern selected and we have one design up on the screen, we can press the key again and that will give us a second one. But watch how this design can look completely different when I flip that from top to bottom. Now we have the two points of the design meeting together. So the machine will now sew the first design, come to the point, sew the second design, and then it will do a tie off right at the end of that pattern cycle for me. So um, that's a really nice feature. The next icon has actually been deselected. It's not even available for us to press because of the type of design that we currently have up on the screen. So Patrick's going to go ahead and go back to our utility stitches. And this is where um, now it's selected so I can use it. This is our twin needle option. Um, I am going to be doing a whole baby lock club on twin needle sewing and twin needle embroidery sewing too. Um, but the twin needle sewing, watch what happens to the stitch when I select the twin needle. It put a second row on the screen. I hope you can see that there. Um, so it actually goes in and puts like a parallel line of stitching right next to it. The other thing that it does for us, although there are a lot of different size twin needles, the most basic size is 2.5. So what the machine actually does is decreases the stitch width of the stitch that you have selected by 2.5 millimeters to automatically allow you to use your twin needle without having to make any manual adjustments to the width. Now, if you're using a 4.0 twin needle, you would still need to manually make the adjustment um, because the stitch width, the needle may hit the edge of the hole in the needle plate or your foot if you're not careful with that. Um, but this is the basic, the basic rule of thumb is that the machine will change the stitch width by 2.5 millimeters to allow you to use the standard twin needle. We've already talked a little bit about the buttonhole. This is going to be again be a manual buttonhole where you can actually set the, the slot opening of the buttonhole. And then this one again is going to be a baby lock club feature. It's called the endpoint mark, and it's going to automatically stop the machine at a specific point on your fabric. Um, very, very cool feature. We will cover this in baby lock club. Um, now I'm going to talk to you about some of the manual functions versus um, uh, versus uh, electronic functions. And you saw when I did the the buttonhole, I can actually set my machine up for an automatic tie off and an automatic cut at the end of my seam on my screen. When I do it on the screen, the machine knows that I want to do this eventually, but it's not going to know when. So you actually have to tell the machine that you're coming to the end of your seam. Now, when we have our tie off um, uh, selected, when we very first start sewing, it's automatically going to do the tie off that we have selected. Okay. Um, but after I start sewing, the machine doesn't know when I'm coming to the end of my seam. Just because I lift up on my presser foot doesn't mean I'm on the end of my seam. So we have to tell it using the, um, using the reverse button on my um, screen here. And again, when we get to the end of the seam, you can touch that button, it'll do the other tie off and then automatically cut our threads for us because we have this auto feature selected over here. When it's highlighted in blue, that's what you're doing, okay? Um, this is needle up or needle down. And again, because we have the twin needle option selected over here, you can see I've got the twin needle over here selected. It's kind of funny that they do that, but again, Right now it's telling me that we're gonna stop with the needle in the down position anytime we stop. If you touch it, it'll touch the needle in the up position. And we can also um, control our pivot. This is our pivot feature. And again, from the so soprano on up, you have that pivot function in your machine. 
So those are the electronic functions within the machine that um, we thought it was important to cover for you. Okay, so I think we're going to move on to memory settings within the sewing screen. Good. So this is kind of a fun feature. And again, this is on 98% of the machines. I, I'm not sure which ones have the... the. I think it's from the ARIA and up. ARIA, okay. Mm -hmm. So every stitch in here has a, um, a capability of five different menus, or excuse me, five different um, memories within each stitch. It's an incredible memory system that these machines have. So um, Kate was showing you applique yesterday in live, and she has a specific setting that she likes to do on her applique stitch. Always. Always, yes. So, and it doesn't happen to be default. And so you can see when we get into that stitch, we've got all of our default settings come up, okay? But Kate, what, what is your? Three and three. Three and three. So she likes to have her width at the three millimeters. That's actually not the stitch I use though. Oh, it isn't? It's 14. Oh, I see. Okay. So she has her width at three millimeters and she has her length at three millimeters. Um, so anytime that she does this stitch, she wants that to be her setting. So we can actually set our stitch into memory. And you can see, I'm going to touch the memory icon here. It automatically saves that setting for us. Now we can do up to say I come along and I like to do applique too. And I want, so I'm going to get out of that stitch. And now I'm going to get back into it. And you can see it automatically comes up with that setting because I have saved that into memory. But let's say that I want to actually go ahead and um, uh, I like my settings at, well, we want to do the other way. I'm going to go to 2.0. And I want my byte to be 4.25. Uh, so I'm going to touch my memory icon again. And again, now it saved my particular setting in there. Or maybe you have a project that you're doing a lot. Now, if we want to go into those two different settings, all we have to do is touch the retrieve button. And you can see Kate's setting is in number one. My setting is in number two. You just have to touch the one you want, touch OK. And whoops. Um, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button there. Touch the one that you want, touch retrieve, and it'll automatically come up with that particular um, stitch. Again, I wanna reemphasize every single stitch in this machine, you can do that five different times. Um, so you, you've got tremendous memory capability within, uh, within your machine, even uh, all the way down to the, to the Presto and the and the lyric. And this so. is a feature that I use a lot because I quite often will start a project, maybe a big project, but I don't necessarily finish it. And I don't want to have to write down my settings that I use so that next time I come back to work on my project, I can just pop it into a machine memory. And then the next time I come back, I just retrieve it and it's all preset for me. And then I can continue on with my project and I know that my stitch is the exact size and width and length that I had previously. Yes, yeah, so this is a, uh, I would highly, highly recommend um, using that memory function. It's a very, very simple application. And again, just touch retrieve and it'll, you just touch the number and touch the retrieve option. You have to remember to do that, um, but that is uh, how to, um, how to utilize the memory of your utility stitches. We'll go to decorative. Sure. Go into the... yes. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to show you how you can um, program in a name that you might want to do within your decorative stitches. So you can see across the top here that I can't see all of my categories. So these are scroll. So we can actually just scroll along until we get to the alphabets. Now these are alphabets using your feed dogs. So this is not hoop. It's not the big pretty alphabets or the monogramming. So we're just gonna go into our standard block lettering and you're gonna get a keypad up. And we can go in there. We've got the same, a lot of these icons are gonna look really familiar to you um, from the embroidery side of the machine. But um, let's just go ahead and we'll put Patrick's name in. So we're gonna do a P, 
Now, do you notice that the P comes in sideways? It's going to show you exactly how it's going to sew. So we've got the P and then we're gonna to go to lowercase and A, and then we're gonna type the rest of this in. And you will notice that the automatic tie off is highlighted because it knows that we probably don't want to tie, we don't want to sew Patrick, Patrick, Patrick. One Patrick is enough, right? <laughs> so what it does is it knows that it's going to sew the Patrick, it's going to automatically tie off for us. If we wanted it to cut at the end of the name, we would use the cut function right here. So we would highlight the cutter and then it would automatically cut for us. Um, so if this now is you something you want to save that in the memory because you're going to use it over and over. I am going to use it over and over again. You're right. <laughs> so if we want to save this because this is something that you might want to sew over multiple times, you would just use your memory button right down here. And then you would get your memory options so you can save it to the machine memory to the USB top drive or the USB second drive. You've got two USB drives on a Solaris, on a lot of the baby logs actually. On a lot of the baby mm -hmm. logs, yes, exactly. So we're gonna tell it that we want to go ahead and we wanna put it into the machine memory. Now, a lot of you then realize that this is the same as on, a, on your computers, right? You put it, you save it onto your computer somewhere, but you don't know where to go to retrieve it, okay? So it actually has gone in. Let's go ahead and we will um, use our memory pocket right here. Whoops. Um, so we actually go to our memory pocket. This is where we will retrieve the information. So you go to your memory pocket and here it's showing us that we have Patrick in the memory and you would just press that. And now it's actually brought it up on top of it because I didn't delete the first one. But I think you get the general idea. So once you have created it, put it into memory. If you have stored it into the machine memory, you will retrieve that by going to the memory pocket. Can we show them over on the um, Unity? Because that's going to be a big difference between the Solaris and the other machines is how you store into memory. So again, I've got the same thing pulled up on my, um, on my Unity here. And again, most machines, again, from the Lyric on up, Lyric is a little bit different. Lyric and the, the Soprano. We should probably brought one of those. It's K. K, thank you. All right, so we've got that. So now we can actually touch, in order to save this into memory, we don't have anything listed as memory, but you do have that little memory pocket icon on the screen. So anytime you see that, we can touch the memory pocket. And again, it gives us the same options on where we want to save it to. You touch it. Now, if we want to pull that up, we'll go back into our decorative stitches here. And you can see we have an icon here that, that says pull from memory. We can either pull from the machine memory or the USB stick or directly from the computer. And I've got two of those pulled up into memory. We just touch that button and, and then touch the um, other icon with the blue arrow to it and it'll pull it up onto our screen for, uh, for us to sew out now. So we have a question about how do you erase a letter if you've made it by mistake? So in order to do that, uh-oh. The delete key. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, I, I hope you can see this on the screen, but the K is actually highlighted in blue on this. So if we touch the delete key, it's gonna delete whatever's highlighted in blue there. So we can continue to delete that until I am completely gone. So that's the- That's how I get rid of you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the way you're gonna, gonna utilize that delete or get rid of the- Okay. So one feature that we probably get asked this question once a week. So this is something that I do want to spend a little bit of time explaining to you because I think there's a lot of confusion over um, a tie-off. Um, 
and sometimes yeah. your machine sews a um sews a um a regular stitch in place and sometimes your machine will sew a traditional um, tie off which would be a few stitches forward and a few stitches back so we're going to have to get the camera really close to the screen so you can see this because a lot of people look at the um these stitches and they're like well why do i have four straight stitches and there is a reason and i'm going to use a pair of scissors to point here okay so one dash zero one and this is going to be a lot on the baby locks you'll notice first of all that the the stitch is offset to the left side that means it's a default of a left needle position but you'll notice at the beginning of the stitch there is a dash do you see that little dash right there as opposed to one dash oh two that has a dot at the beginning if we move over to program number three and four, you're gonna notice now that the um, needle is in the center. So it's in the center needle position with a dash at the front or a, um, if you go over to one dash zero four, there's a dot at the beginning. So now that you have all determined that you have a dot or a dash at the beginning, let's look at what that really means to us when we are sewing. And it's the same for zigzag too, by the way. Again, you wonder why you have four different zigzags? Again, we've got um, starting at the right needle position and we've got a dash and we've got a dot for the quilters tie off. And then again, so that's the difference in those tie offs. Okay, so I'm actually going to demonstrate that a little bit to you. Um, can you grab me a foot out of this machine, please? You need me to hold that closer. Yeah, I probably am going to have you hold this closer. Do I have a foot control? Yeah. Can you get me? Please? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at um, stitch number one dash o three, which is our um, How can they see center there? needle position. I think they'll see it from there. This is center needle position with a traditional reverse. And what I mean by a traditional reverse is a few stitches forward, a few stitches back, and then it continues to sew forward. So let me sew, that, show, sew this for you so you can see. So the machine is going to sew forward. You don't have it electronically. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. We're going to show that again because we forgot to remember I was telling you, this is the auto tie off feature here. So you want to make sure that that, that, that auto tie off feature is on. Okay, so now what you're going to do is you're going to let it start to sew. It's going to sew forwards and backwards. And then it will continue sewing forwards. Now, every time you stop, you don't want the tie off. Okay, so every time you stop, you don't want the tie off. But what you do need to do is you need to have a command button to tell the machine when I get to the end of my seam where to do my tie off. So we're gonna go ahead and we are going to go all the way to the end of my seam. And then I'm going to use my reverse button right here. And it's gonna sew backwards and forwards and the machine has stopped completely. Now, if you had your scissors on, it would also cut. So that, that's the other thing that you can program in. So this is a traditional reverse tie on. So forwards, backwards and forwards. And then when it gets to the end, backwards and forwards and stop. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select stitch number one dash oh four, which has the little dot in front of the straight stitch. So you can see the difference. Go ahead and turn the scissors on too. So now instead of traveling forwards, the machine is going to stitch in place. Now, because she did the tie off at the end of that, the machine knows that it's starting a new seam and it's gonna automatically do that. You can see how it did four stitches straight up and down. So it's the same thing. Every time you stop, you don't want the tie off coming on. So it's just gonna stop. When I get to the end of my seam, I'm gonna tap 
and it does my tie off and cuts and raises my presser foot all for me. Yay. So that is the difference in tie offs and how you utilize that with the, again, this is on most baby lock machines that have the scissors option, have a way of programming it on the screen where you can do it automatically. So wait, program how many stitches it sews backwards. No. You can um, hold that button in and you can sew backwards as far as you want. So not the automatic though. Yeah, not the automatic, that's correct. So if you are using the function on the machine with the automatic tie off, no, you cannot control that. So if you want to control how long it is sewing backwards, you would want to use what I call the on-demand button, which is right here. Sounds and like the television. On-demand? Yeah. <laughs> so I call these my on-demand. It's gonna do whatever I tell it to do right there. This is pre-programmed. So the icons are the same, but this is pre-programmed and these ones over here are going to be my on-demand. Why don't you show them on-demand on the On-demand, on okay, so I'm gonna remove all of my um, features here. And probably go to that one there. Do you wanna just kind of get? Yep. So this is using um, reverse just in a traditional way, which means when I start to sew, I'm gonna sew a few stitches forward and then I'm gonna hold in my reverse. My reverse is gonna keep going in reverse till I release. And then when I get to the end of my seam, hold in your reverse and let go. So this is totally mechanical. So my, my tie off now is much longer. The automatic tie off is just about three stitches. This one was probably about eight or nine stitches. So the other feature that I want to show you on this screen is also our, um, what we call our left right shift. So it's on the screen and it shows it as an LR shift. And it's this function right here. An LR shift is moving the whole pattern to the left or to the right. Um, in a straight stitch, it really is acting as your needle position. But you can actually have an LR shift on a zigzag. So if we have the um, zigzag, the zigzag is going to center itself in the foot. But if I use an LR shift, what it does is it's not changing the width of the stitch because my width of my zigzag is controlled by this button right here. But now my left right shift will move my whole design to the left or to the right of center. That's awesome. I never knew that. You didn't know that? No. I taught you something today? I, yes, that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is good really for um, aligning multiple rows of stitches. Maybe you want to use the edge of the foot, but the edge of the foot really doesn't put the stitch quite close enough. So by using your LR shift, you can move the design or move the stitch within the foot. So does it actually move it on the screen yeah. too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, this is cool. You should sign up for more of my I classes. Should, exactly. <laughs> 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 okay, I think that we have covered everything on that main screen. Was the um, we did that? Yeah. I actually think we are. I think Pretty we've well covered done. everything that yeah. we put into the handout. Does anybody have any questions for us at all? Padlock key. Which one is that, Barb? And we didn't cover any of the the top screen. Uh, the top. Oh, you want to go through that? Let's do that really quick. Because um, on the higher end machines, you also have a video library on these. So um, hold on, I want to see if it doesn't have one in the... So this is only going to be for the Destiny and the, um, the, and the Solaris. I think it was on the Alissimo too. Alissimo mm -hmm. also. So if you touch the little... Um, um, question mark at the top here 
Uh, of course, they don't print manuals out anymore um, for the Solaris. So you can actually get into your manual with this screen, but you also have a video library within there. And again, um, if you wanna know how to wind the bobbin, my way's better, so I wouldn't pay attention to the video, but. Oh my. <laughs> or if you wanted to know how to, again, any of your sewing operations, what we were covering, how to turn on the projector in this instance, um, how to do a buttonhole. Um, so it's going to have a really, really nice little video for you, the endpoint mark. So you could, if you want to learn how to do that, um, you're going to have a, a complete video in there. It's four minutes and 13 seconds. You can fast forward, you can scroll back, whatever you wanted to do. Um, so again, that the little button up at the top here is a really powerful little tool for you to use if you want a refresher on any of that stuff. And it's got it on all different formats, even some machine maintenance in there for you. So um, this other button up here, this is what made me, um, made me think of this. If you've got little kids around that you don't want them to be able to um, turn the machine on by accident, we can actually, with this button up at the top here, we can freeze our machine completely. So nothing that we touch is going to allow the machine to operate. So again, it's just a safety feature that you can utilize. It's the presser foot with the needle next to it. A lot of the electronic machines have that function. So it'll actually freeze the so machine. So you. your instruction manuals will actually tell you that this is the um, icon you're supposed to press when you change your foot or you change your needle. Yes, it's that's so correct. that you don't accidentally hurt yourself. Um, but it's also a good one to to press really quick. If you're sewing with grandchildren and you're going to step away, you press that really quick. They're probably not going to. Well, they might figure out how to unlock it, but <laughs> it basically locks the machine from doing anything. What's that one? It freezes the screen. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now nobody can do it while you're sewing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what that, the one next to it, I learned something else. Mm -hmm. I've learned two things. So this is good. Um, so this will just freeze the screen so you can still sew, but um, nobody can change your settings by accident. Again, if you're. And uh, I have found this to be useful. There has been twice that I have used this function or uh, feature. And the reason being is, the screens are angled towards mm -hmm. you so that they are um, easy to see. Yeah. Um, but if you imagine that you've got a big quilt and you've got your arms and you're trying to like cradle your quilt and you can, you can actually have your project touch the screen and it can either change the stitch or it can do something for you. Um, so I've actually locked my screen a couple of times when I've been working on really big projects so that it doesn't accidentally um, change what I'm working on. Just don't forget that you locked it. So, because then you'll try to change the stitch and you're wondering Bob why says that's exactly working. how she found out about the lock key. <laughs> <laughs> um, was because you can accidentally touch it with your arm or your quilt or something of that nature too, yes. All right, anything else? Um, I think, unless we have any other questions. Well, good. Well, I'm glad that somebody learned, that's good. So um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, you make sure you, um, you hit us up with those. Again, this was the sewing basics. We are gonna do an embroidery basics, I think next week, aren't we? I think it's next week. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna do an embroidery basics. We're also gonna do an IQ designer basics for those of you with the IQ designer. So- We um, do not have that one scheduled yet. Oh, we don't, okay. No. Okay. And I'm also gonna do a maintenance class. So that's gonna be another thing on the agenda that we're gonna get recorded here too, so. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we appreciate it. And we will be emailing you the link for this later this afternoon. Correct. Um, so you will be able to watch this over and over and over again. <laughs> you lucky people. <laughs> Lots of nice comments there. That's we can't good. read them nice. all because they're coming you. through so quickly. Yeah, so. Right. We will let you all go and hopefully you will all be joining us at two o'clock for a fun live. Yeah, Christine's doing it today. Christine is doing it today. All yes. right, that's good. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and have a fabulous rest of your day. Bye. <laughs>